Good evening, everyone. Um, truly delighted to be here tonight. Um, and I've had, to, had the opportunity to speak in the last year, particularly in several um, universities, um, campuses in the United States, in China, in Switzerland. The last one I did was at the Sloan School of Management. Uh, and I always come away um, tremendously energized um, from these discussions. Um, and um, as Professor Kumar said, uh, the visit particularly hits close to home uh, because I spent a um, good part of four and a half years studying here in this country, both uh, getting my bachelor's degree as well as my master's degree. And I'm not going to um, bother you listing all the different uh, changes that have taken place in our world uh, since I was at university in the 1970s, before many of you were born. Uh, one evolution that I will mention, however, uh, an important one, is the dramatic transformation of here, this institution, London Business School, over the years. In just uh, under four decades, this wonderful, great institution has gone from a startup with an ambitious objective goal to one of the world's preeminent uh, business schools, academic institutions. And uh, that is quite an accomplishment. So uh, I, I pay tribute to you. Uh, in essence, the London Business School has, what it has done is it has compressed time, an essential capability, really, in uh, an era, in our era here, um, uh, where the rate of knowledge is actually doubling every five to ten years. Tonight, what I would like to do is I would like to talk about doing business in this era of incredible change that we all live in. Specifically, I want to give you some highlights of uh, big trends that we here at the Coca-Cola Company see emerging in the global marketplace and trends that we think will have a pretty dramatic shape in how our world looks uh, as you all prepare to launch into your lives, into your careers, and continue successfully. And in this discussion, I'll try to explain uh, how we're positioning our business uh, at Coca-Cola in this changing, rapidly changing environment and how we apply our learning and leadership uh, in the years to come. Mostly though, I want to stress that I, I look forward to our dialogue um, after my comments because I think uh, I've always come away, as I said, tremendously energized by uh, the intellectual stimulus of the dialogue uh, that I've had um, in such occasions. And let me start by painting a picture of what I call the new equilibrium. Four essentially massive forces that are changing the balance, I believe, of global economic order. The first one is rising oil prices, followed secondly by rising food prices. The third one is growing middle class in the world at a tremendous rate. And, and the fourth is, is, is rapid tremendously rapid urbanization. I think that we are truly at, at one of those um, important inflection points in the world, um, what we can term as, as defining moments, um, when all the rules that we are used to are changing and how we move forward will change. How well we understand, comprehend these new realities, accept them, prepare for them, will un undoubtedly determine, <coughs> determine our success or failure in the coming years. Let's look at the first one, um, the rising price of oil. Most experts today essentially agree that oil is not spiking, but it's simply rising. While some of the rise may be related to speculation, 20%, 30%, it's still a small percentage. It's never going to go back to the 40s. So, the reasons for that are simple. It's just basically greater global consumption of energy coupled with harder to reach oil deposits resulting in prices that are going to be sustainably higher than we're ever used to. And the world is now essentially paying about five billion more every day for crude and essentially to five or six nations. This is fueling one of the largest, largest, incredible transfers of wealth in history. 
I was at Davos this year in February at the World Economic Forum, and I can't tell you that there was any topic more, more talked about, more discussed than this, um, this shift of wealth. I'm traveling to Russia, uh, to St. Petersburg next week, um, at uh, the end of next week, to, uh, to talk at the co-chair of the World Economic Forum meeting in St. Petersburg. And this will also be, I know, I know a huge point of discussion uh, in that oil-producing uh, nation that is beginning to reassert itself again in the world. And it's now estimated that the um, oil-rich nations have $4 trillion of cash, of petrodollar investments around the world. Um, that's two times the, ch the, the, the Chinese economy, $4 trillion. And you know, you look at the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority is now one of the largest shareholders of Citigroup, or Singapore's GIC now owning $15 billion stake in UBS, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, oil booms, oil boosts are not exactly uncommon. What is different now, however, today, that's the important point, is that we're seeing solid, gradual gains as opposed to southern peaks and valleys. That's the key. This leads me to the second point, which is um, really going to also have far-reaching consequences, which is the component uh, that is really of this sh huge shifting landscape, which is surge in production of biofuels like ethanol, which is, again, one of the key reasons why food prices are rising at rates that the world has never seen. Corn, wheat, barley, rice. Uh, so here we are, higher energy costs, hugely higher energy costs, and higher food costs. So now factor in the sustained increase in demand for food and energy that's being prompted by rising living standards that leads us to the third point, which is the growing global middle class. By 2015, the number of middle class in the world is going to rise by 700 million, mostly in emerging markets. That's two times the size of the United States today that will ascend to the middle class. Only 20 million of those will come Will, will be in the United States, those incremental middle class. 680 million outside of the United States. This new middle class, these new middle class consumers are going to strive for the same things that we all are used to in life. Cars, appliances, homes, better quality food, better entertainment, and hopefully better beverages. <laughs> so, like their counterparts in the developed world, most of these middle class consumers are going to also reside in urban areas. That's the fourth point, component of this new equilibrium. For the first time in the history of our world, there are now more people living in urban centers than in rural areas in the world. That happened for the first time last year. And the trend is just beginning. For the next decade, 10 years, for the next decade, about 65 million people annually are going to commute to urban areas from non-urban areas. So that's essentially adding a city the size of London every 80 days to the globe. That's the rate of change that's taking place. So huge, all of this together brings huge challenges, huge challenges and huge opportunities. And for all of us, there is no question it's going to take huge, huge shifts in thinking, shifts in behavior, shifts in our own view of this world that we operate in, we live in. At Coca-Cola, we certainly see the challenges, we see the opportunities. For starters, our system is an important, very important commercial consumer of energy, consumer of agriculture, rising commodity prices for everything from plastics to oil, citrus, corn, have a significant impact on our system's business. We're one of the largest buyers in the world of corn for sweeteners. We're one of the largest buyers in the world for resin, for our packaging. We're one of the largest buyers in the world for, um, for commercial Diesel, we have our trucks 
number more than UPS, DHL, FedEx put together in the world. Streamlining our supply chain and productivity has never been more important. Never. And balancing the risks and opportunities has never, never been more important either. And at the same time, as I said, we do see a world of huge opportunity. A world of more consumers with more money drinking more ready-to-drink beverages as their urban, on-the-go lifestyles generate the demand. Essentially, mobility, urbanization are directly, directly uh, linked to increase in demand for ready-to-drink beverages. So we are bullish about the global beverage industry, where it's headed. Um, and unlike, unlike durable goods such as washing machines, refrigerators, cars, homes, which you buy once and hold for years, the beverage industry is one of continuous replenishment. Today, for instance, or, or let, let's take yesterday, because today is not over, one and a half billion servings of our beverages were, were basically consumed by the world's population. So we are invited one and a half billion times into the lives of consumers around the world every day. And over the next several years, the total industry, which is about a $650 billion industry, the total industry that we operate in, the non-alcoholic, ready-to-drink beverage industry, is expected to grow faster than the world GDP for the reasons I mentioned. Um, there, and also that industry, the non-alcoholic, ready-to-drink industry, is growing faster than other fast-moving consumer goods, like cosmetics, like toiletries, like packaged goods, like household care, like snack foods. You, the, the rate of growth of, of, of non-alcoholic ready to drink is about 6% in the world. The rate of growth for the rest that I've just mentioned is between 2 to 4% of, of those other industries. So what we're seeing around the world are consumers demanding and responding to greater choice. To provide this choice that consumers need, we have expanded our portfolio from what it used to be traditionally through innovation. In fact, almost 10% of what we sell today, or 2 billion unit cases, we sell about 22 billion unit cases, 10% of what we sell come from products that did not exist only three years ago. New products that we've basically put out into the marketplace. Coke Zero is a great example. We introduced it less than three years ago um, in the US. It was brought to Britain uh, almost two years ago. It's, I hope some of you have tried it. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's now been a pretty big hit. It's uh, grown globally about 250%, and it's now in 81 markets. It's bringing people back to this industry called sparkling beverages. Last year, on the heels of the success of Coke Zero, our, our total Coca-Cola trademark category, which includes Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola Light, and Coca-Cola Zero, grew at its highest rate since a decade. As encouraged we are by this, we're equally excited by the balanced growth in our portfolio. Today, almost 40% of our growth is coming also from still beverages, juices, teas, ready-to-drink teas, ready-to-drink coffees, energy drinks, waters, sports drinks. And industry-wide, by 2010, profit growth is expected to be virtually split almost 50-50 between sparkling beverages and still beverages for the Coca-Cola system. And it's also becoming more balanced from a ge geography point of view. By 2010, again, emerging economies will account for over 60% of the global beverage industry's growth, 60%, up from only a third today. So in, today, the growth in emerge, from emerging markets is only a third of total industry growth. In, by 2010, it'll, be, it'll double to 60% and over. So we feel ideally that we, we can benefit from these tailwinds as a global system. We have the scale. We operate in more than 200 markets around the world. We produce in 200 markets around the world. That's more than the UN representation. And with, with about 85, almost 85% of our 
earnings coming now from outside of the United States. We, all, we often say we, we're, we're, we're a global company that happens to be headquartered in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, we have the commercial reach. Globally, we serve 20 million customers every day. These are customers like supermarkets, kiosks, restaurants, etc. From the largest international supermarkets like Walmart to small restaurants, individual private restaurants, individual kiosks around the corner stores. And we, have, we do have an unmatched global footprint of brands that have made us industry leaders in different categories, in both juices, sparkling beverages, juice drinks, coffee, as I said. As, as of 2007, last year, uh, number two globally in sports drinks, number one in sparkling, number one certainly in juices, number one in juice drinks, number one in teas, number one in, in coffee. Nobody, nobody really associates the Coca-Cola company for being number one in all those categories. And number two, as I said, in, in sports drinks, and number three globally in water, in packaged water. This combination of scale, reach, and footprint, coupled with the trends, the four important trends I spoke of, has had a major impact on our business. And to capture more of these global opportunities, we have outlined five key priorities for us going forward. Number one, we have to keep on growing our sparkling beverage portfolio, led by trademark Coca-Cola. That's not an option for us. And we do that through innovation, innovation in formulation, innovation in what we offer the consumer, innovation in packaging, innovation in the way we go to market, every aspect of innovation. Secondly, you've seen some of the successes uh, that I've talked about, you've heard about them. We have to continue to grow our still beverage footprint. Still beverages, as I said, are all those beverages that don't contain bubbles, non-carbonated beverages. Leveraging, thirdly, we have to leverage our geographic balance growth. We cannot just be satisfied with growing in emerging markets, brick markets. We have to grow in Western markets through innovation, and we have to grow in emerging markets through expanding our, our, our horizontal uh, uh, reach in, in emerging markets. Fourthly, the fourth priority we've outlined for us is expediting our in innovation pipeline. Uh, innovation is what gets us to grow organically. I always say internally in the Coca-Cola company, organic growth is our oxygen. We can never trade organic growth for acquisition growth. Acquisition growth must, must always come on top of organic growth. And fifth, to expand our system capabilities, uh, the fifth priority. And, and we've said inside the Coca-Cola company, we have to do three things better than anybody in the world to succeed, to continue to succeed. Number one, inspirational consumer marketing. We have to be the best in the world. Number two, commercial leadership, which we say is the gearbox of converting that consumer marketing into sales in the four walls of our customers, the 20 million customers. And number three is what we say franchise leadership, which is how we work with about 300 bottling partners around the world, because we are a franchise business, and in most of our bottling companies, we own equity, but not control equity. Control in some of them, most of them, they're independently run companies tied to us with a franchise contract as well as with some minority equity in them. So we're addressing all these priorities um, in the spirit of what we call, what I term as being constructively discontent. We see the glass half full all the time. They say to me sometimes, what is the single thing that scares you the most, that keeps you awake? And I say, arrogance because that's the, that's the thing that derailed us in the 19, um, late 90s. Uh, we've, we've been able to put the vehicle back on the asphalt, on the tarmac, uh, and the thing that scares me the most is, the, is this, this wonderfully motivated group of 90,000 employees of the Coca-Cola company, 800,000 employees of the Coca-Cola system around the world can, become, can get arrogant again, and that's when you start losing. So, I always say constructively discontent. Victory is never there. You're always close to it, but it should never be there. So around the world today, our company and bottling partners, we sell, we generate a revenue of roughly around $85 billion uh, every year. 
we have therefore 85 billion of the 650 billion consumer spend on this industry. So we've got a long way to go. We don't, you know, we, 85 out of 650 gives you a lot of room to grow, share in a growing industry. So we always believe there's much more out there for us. The health and vibrancy of today's global beverage industry really is, in a way, at the perfect metaphor for the future of the global economy. In fact, few in, very few industries are more integrated into the global economy than ours. Consider this scenario. You start your day with a glass of orange juice, hopefully it's one of ours, produced from oranges that are grown in Brazil, the largest grower of oranges in the world. As you arrive for work, you pour yourself a cup of coffee, made cup of coffee in a, in a can, in a bottle, ready to drink coffee, made from beans that originated from Indonesia or Ethiopia or Colombia. You top it from, with, with rich cream from another country, a Western country. And at lunch, you reach for an ice cold glass of Coke, made with secret ingredients from all around the world. <laughs> At dinner, you opt for a mineral water from the highlands. You see where I'm going with this. Each day, the average beverage consumer has really, really has the chance, opportunity to complete a culinary trip from all around the world, thanks to the benefits of free trade. He or she sampling some of the best the world has to offer. And you can no, you can gather by that that I am an advocate of free trade and global markets. I guess I come by it naturally. I grew up in a, as, as Professor Kumar said, in a diplomatic family. I was born in the States, raised in Thailand, studied, uh, went to started school in, 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 um, in India, Iran, then France, Sweden, and then started, uh, went to university in Britain. And then in my career life in Coca-Cola, I worked in, um, in North Africa, I worked in um, Italy, in Holland, in Vienna, Turkey, Hong Kong, and, and now back in the United States. Um, and, and I think, you know, it's, it's, it, part of this, this, where we are today is a result of some of the benefits, for sure more than negatives, of free trade. Um, I, I, the world I've seen, the world really many of you have seen, is a rich, dynamic, diverse world. A world that has more common things than non-common things, than differences. It's a world that is becoming more affluent, no question about it. And hopefully has a brighter future. Positive forces of trade, of globalization, have made that possible. There are some challenges. And as business leaders, we all also understand that we have a greater, great responsibility today. Um, I talked about some of the stress points, energy, food, huge, placing huge demands on politicians, on business, um, and trying to stop the momentum of globalization, though, is not going to get us to where we need to go. It's, in, in a way, you know, trade has been around since the early Phoenicians that really um, plied the Mediterranean with their ships. And it's continued since man has walked the planet. The question that we have to all answer, all of us collectively, is how is it going to progress? By itself, globalization really is neither positive or neither negative. The question is, it's up to us how it progresses in a positive way and in a balanced way. That's the, that's the picture of success. And that is a huge responsibility. And it's something that we at Coca-Cola do not take lightly operating and producing in 200 markets, employing globally as a system 800,000 people. And today, the sustainability movement, which we call, uh, um, uh, in the lack of a better name, 
is spreading to all corners of the planet very fast. And there's no more West versus emerging in every market that you do business. It is one of the key areas that you have to succeed in. And I think we think that's a positive trend that brings that balance. Uh, and it speaks to the growing awareness of, of, of harmony that is needed out there for, for, for globalization and for, for, for free trade to progress in the right way. And we have seen it through our own experiences, time and time after again, that our business in any market we operate in is only as healthy as the communities that we serve in those markets. There, we think that there is an absolute, clear, one-to-one -one regression fit between healthy, sustainable communities and healthy, sustainable business. We've long recognized the responsibility to lead in this area, but also knowing and wise enough that we can't do it alone. Solving society's challenges takes real, focused leadership and partnership more than ever before. Partnership between civil society, business, and government. Absolute, and, and it's more ripe than ever before for those partnerships to take place. Think about this. In 1800, the population of the world was 1 billion. Today, 200 years later, 7 billion. That's a sevenfold increase. And by 2100, not too far away, it's estimated that it's going to grow to 12 billion. And most of the 12 billion are going to be living in urban areas. And since the year 1800, when the world's population was 1 billion, emissions have grown 22 times, when population has grown 7 times. We know that this is not sustainable. And we know today, more than ever, that there is an opportunity for business to partner with governments and civil society to play a meaningful role to help create sustainable communities. That's why in recent years, we and the Coca-Cola company have partnered with Greenpeace, for example, to develop eco-friendly cold drink equipment. We have 20 million pieces of cold drink equipment in the world, and we're placing many more. And now we've partnered with Greenpeace to ensure that all our equipment will be HFC-free equipment. That's why last year we worked with the United Nations to develop a plan to reduce our global water usage. That's why we're partnering with local communities in more than 50 markets to support healthy watersheds, programs to collect water, and community water and sanitation programs. And that's why we're working with a host of other communities and agencies to create innovative recycling solutions for our beverage packaging. And at Coca-Cola, we believe that a true 21st century global company, global system like ours, is one that must be a fully, fully engaged partner in ensuring that it can play a meaningful role in creating these sustainable communities. And we're also looking for future leaders who understand this, who understand the importance of what we're talking about in sustainable communities, and who are capable of helping us manage today's realities. We want people in our system who know how to work in teams, who can navigate well across cultures and build lasting relationships. Sounds like the work that you've been doing here in London Business School. We're not looking for people who choose to surround themselves with others who see the world exactly the same like they do. We're not looking for people who like to carry their own comfortable environment in London to Lagos. We look for managers who seek out a variety of diverse people, attitudes, beliefs, diverse experiences, who can assimilate and be as comfortable in different environments as their own. Life in the 21st century, we feel, is going to be all about continuous learning, all about relationships and all about flexibility. It's going to be about engaging your mind, engaging your imagination. 
And in this, just want to leave you before we get into the dialogue with just a few last remarks that I feel that's helped me in my career, in my life. Um, holding those deep relationships with great amount of respect, importance. Hold those relationships that you establish here close to your heart um, at this great university institution and let those relationships serve you as models for the way that you all will engage with all the new people that will enter your life. That, to me, has always been a wonderful experience. And uh, relationships will, I feel, will, will, will be at the heart of, 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 of the future of many of you. And B, I know you will, but importantly, always remember that it, it's, it's so important to move through different cultures. Never to lose that ability to adapt quickly to change. Uh, and the demographics of the world are changing. And our ability to work through those cultures and geographic borders and differences of point of view are going to be essential in the future, more than ever before. And then I think everybody today has to give back to the world. Our world grows more interdependent by the day. We're only as strong as enduring as sustainable communities that we personally even support and help. And the great diversity of this great institution, I believe, with its mission of seeking tolerance and truth, will serve everyone here very well, all of you. So I want to just end by thanking Professor Kumar and thanking Robin Buchanan for giving me this opportunity and this uh, to be with you today. And thank you for your time this afternoon and this evening. And I look forward to questions and answers. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.